And greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where we all fight the good fight. Very happy to be here with you for a second week in a row. What is up with that? I'm sure some of you are almost in a state of shock. Like, what? What's he doing? He's never on two weeks in a row anymore. Well, it's happened, so just deal with it. Uh, I saw some interesting news that uh, came up recently in the UFO field. I thought I wanted to comment on it. And uh, so that's why we're, I'm doing this. Um, it is true. Like I'm thinking about this. Like I'm not, I'm not really like a YouTube pro. Like that's just, that's really the truth. Like for example, oh, by the way, greetings to the chat family. I see all of you in there just doing your thing. Um, but I, I've read, I read some comments from last week's show and uh, I felt a little bad. So they were very nice comments, and I want to thank all of you who really supported uh, last week's marathon show, which was one hour and 40 minutes, a long show. Like, if you hung in there with me for that whole thing, like, wow, like, I don't, that's amazing. But um, so I was looking at some comments, and uh, one one person just said, you know, if Dolan really wants to get to 100,000 subscribers, because I was talking about that, he said he should really do more shows, which, check, I totally agree. And he might want to consider making them a little shorter, which is really like a good idea. Like I, I've agreed with that for the longest time. I've absolutely been on board with that. Here's my problem because I'm not, I'm not really a YouTube pro. So like there are people out there on YouTube who are so good at this. Like they've got it down. They've got a system in place. They, their shows are exactly in a certain format. Like I don't really, that, that's not what I do here. Like it would be nice um, but the thing is like, there's just not that team of production people. Like I got, I've got other things that I work on here. Like I, I've got my website that I run over at Richard Olin members. By the way, I see a lot of you in there, uh, in the chat room. Good to see you there. And I'm writing my book. In fact, I'll be talking about that as part of this program. That's volume three of UFOs and the national security state, possibly volumes three and four. That's a whole other thing. Anyway, my point is that I've got all of these other things that I work on and, and managing a full-time YouTube uh, presence is kind, of, it's kind of tough. So uh, it's really true. Like I'm not as regular on this as other people are. Um, I will, I try my best to overcome that and it is what it is. So anyway, thank you for being here with me. Um, while I'm talking about that, the very last thing is if you like what I do, if you appreciate any of the content that I have on this channel, and if you haven't yet subscribed, we are this close to 100,000 subscribers. Why don't you subscribe? It doesn't cost you a dime. And it certainly helps me in the war with the evil algorithms, which are always looking to, you know, push the fringe even further into the fringe. So let's do that. Uh, if you think you're going to like the content here, you can already preemptively smash or gently press or destroy that like button or whatever you like. Uh, it's always helpful. Helps to get the likes. And don't forget to turn on the notification bell to get all your notifications so you don't miss this when I come on. Okay, so I'm going to jump in now. Um, so one of the things that we've talked about on this show for quite a while is the apparently upcoming uh, Navy initiated, but the uh, Senate UAP task force report that we're told we're going to be seeing in June, uh, possibly June 1st of this year. So we're talking uh, two and a half months from right now. From right now, we are possibly going to receive, or not we, Congress slash Senate will receive a report from the United States military, apparently discussing important UFO or UAP events, uh, which may have national security implications. Like that's all part of this whole situation here. Now, keep in mind, uh, a lot of that, an undetermined or an unstated portion of that report is going to be classified. Surprise, no surprise there. How much? Probably a substantial amount will be classified. I'll get into my reasons soon. Uh, there will probably be a sliver of halfway decent UFO information that may come to us, some UFO reports, maybe a couple of good photographs, maybe maybe some good video. Um, 
all possible. It's all possible. And I wouldn't expect a total strikeout. I think that is not realistic, but I do expect that uh, for reasons which I'm going to get into very, very momentarily, it will not be possible. It, it will be completely impossible for that task force to have anything remotely approaching the genuine quantity of UFO activity that's out there, particularly uh, activity that is uh, monitored by the United States military, which has capabilities vastly beyond anything that you or I could muster together. They've got satellites out there. They've got all kinds of uh, defense systems, electronic defense systems on the ground and above the ground and under the oceans. And come on, they can monitor this planet in a way that we, the, the citizens can't do. We don't have that capability. Okay. So uh, the thing that prompted me to want to uh, do this program is I'm going to share this with is a statement by John Ratcliffe who's the former recent uh, director of national intelligence uh, during the Trump administration. And this is, he gave an interview, I think it was last Friday, so just a few days ago. And he said a few things here. That's right, picture of Ratcliffe there. And he just says, there are a lot more, he's talking about the upcoming report, by the way, too. There are a lot more sightings than have been made public. Yeah, of course. Some of those have been declassified. Some have been declassified which means others have not. And when we talk about sightings, we are talking about objects that have been seen by Navy or Air Force pilots or have been picked up by satellite imagery that frankly engage in actions that are difficult to explain. Keep, keep in mind, this is a government official and you know these guys are not used to, not everyone talks like Donald Trump. This guy tries to be much more careful with his language and he says, frankly, engage in actions that are difficult to explain. Movements that are hard to replicate, that we don't have the technology for, or traveling at speeds that exceed the sound barrier without a sonic boom. All of this UFO researchers have talked about for generations, okay? Then he goes on, he says, there have been sightings all over the world. When we talk about sightings, he says, the other thing I will tell you is it's not just a pilot or just a satellite or some intelligence collection. Usually we have multiple sensors that are picking up these things. And some of these are unexplained phenomenon. And there is <laughs> actually quite a few more than have been made public. And that's how he wraps, that's how, that's all the main quotes there. So that's John Ratcliffe. Like, that's wow. That's a wow statement. In fact, that was picked up by a lot of, uh, even like corporate controlled establishment news media picked up that statement um, because it's kind of astonishing. Now, it's astonishing if you are living in the dumb, dumb media world where no one knows anything and, you know, you're being spoon fed BS uh, at kindergarten level, uh, and that's basically the entire Western news media complex. But it's not its not news to you, right, if you have even put a little bit of effort into studying the UFO history that exists, like this the real history, the serious history of encounters, military encounters, first and foremost, but also not just military encounters, but sightings by ordinary people around the world, around the world. So, yeah, this is something that, you know, for years and years, I would I would talk about this at conferences or in articles or in my books. And, you know, really, there was not a lot of public for that. Like, there was a very limited number of people who'd be like, wow, I'm really totally into what you have to say. And there's this entire world, meanwhile, that just yawn or not paying attention or just, just oblivious, oblivious to it all. And, and that's because, of course, there's been a, there was uh, for many years, right up until 2017, a complete almost blackballing and a uh, outcasting of UFO news almost altogether. It was almost never reported. Now, since 2017, yes, things have been different. It's been better. It's been better. It hasn't been perfect. Uh, the, the quality of analysis is still, generally speaking, very low, certainly from the mainstream uh, controlled media. There's some of the peripheral mainstream media that does a much better job. Uh, folks at the drive in the war zone, for example, uh, do an excellent job when they cover this and 
There's some other sources that are quasi mainstream that do a decent job. But by and large, coverage is still at a very, very low kind of infantile level. So that yes, when the direct, former director of national intelligence says like, there's a lot going on out here, then ordinary people, that's just like another statement where something relatively shocking comes out. And, and then what you notice though, is like, uh, at least when I was looking at all the various uh, coverage of this, uh, there's really no analysis. There's no commentary. Like no one does that. No, none of the major uh, mainstream publications in any way that I have seen bother to expand by asking some very basic questions of that rather provocative statement. I mean, is, is it not provocative? Yes, it is provocative. So th the fact is, uh, this is something, by the way, that I have talked about a great deal on my website at Richard Olin Members. And uh, the, the fact is, like I've said this last week, some of you wonder, like, well, where is Dolan? Where is he? Well, the fact is I'm over at Richard Olin Members. That is where I put most of uh, my conscious work goes in there or researching for my book, which I did a lot of that last week. But over at Richard Olin Members, I've talked about this issue quite a bit, the issue of massive, massive amounts of UFO sightings that are reported every single week to, there are really two fundamental uh, web-based repositories, uh, particularly in North America for UFO sightings. And the, the best, uh, the most public one of those is the National UFO Reporting Center, New Fork. And then the other one is the MUFON CMS, their um, case management system where MUFON uh, collects uh, lots and lots of the UFO reports also. That, uh, as I've tried to get into that system, that is available only for MUFON uh, investigators. You have to be a, an official MUFON investigator to get access to it. And uh, if you're just a regular person or just a regular researcher like myself, I tried to get in there. I was like, I wanted to read some of these reports, you know. And, uh, but they've got privacy issues. I understand, I understand, but like, come on guys, help some of us out here. I wanna get access to the MUFON and CMS. Anyway, my point is those are the two main repositories of like a lot of web-based UFO reporting. And as I've said this for years, if you tally those totals up for the two sites, you're well over 10,000 distinct sightings a year, okay? Like New Fork National UFO Reporting Center, which you can you can go to that any day. Like all the all the reports are there, and I go there pretty frequently. Uh, for 2020, the last year, um, New Fork tallied 7,241 sightings. That's almost exactly 20 per day. 20 per day. It's a lot of UFO reports. Now keep in mind something. Um, poor Peter Davenport, who runs that website. Like, I really like Peter. Uh, but he has to deal with a lot of, uh, ever since Elon Musk's SpaceX launched the, uh, what is it, the Starlink satellite uh, system, uh, there have been massive numbers of uh, objects reported as UFOs, and they're just the Starlink. So the Starlink is a, it's a series of uh, connected uh, satellites that are lit, like they, they will reflect and you'll see them, and it looks very, it's like a string of pearls going into the sky. And when people see that, it is unusual. But the problem is uh, there were some months last year when Starlink sightings clearly were dominating reports for days and weeks and even for entire months. So there's, a, I guess what I'm saying here is there's a, a fair amount of reports of those 7,000 plus from last year that are just Blame it on Elon, blame it on Musk, uh, the Starlink satellite. And there are uh, obviously many other, you know, conventional uh, explanations for a lot of these UFO reports. Like we all understand that, you know, conventionally we'll just say, well, 90%, just 90% are conventional. And I'm sure that's, pro that's probably very close to true. Could be much, it could be even higher, it could be 95%. It's not 100%, not 100%, but it's fair amount. 
Um, even so, what I have been saying for years, even, even if it's 95%, you take the 5%, that's actually still a lot of very good UFO sightings. And when I say very good, like the fact is like if they go to the National UFO Reporting Center, realistically, very few, if any, some will get investigated by a research group. Some, some actually do. The vast majority do not. So they're raw reports. And so you might think, well, what are you gonna do with a raw report? Uh, the problem with that is like, I think it's irresponsible to toss all those out just because they haven't gotten an official explanation. Some of those raw reports are very detailed statements. Quite a few of them are very detailed statements. And in some cases, one of which I'll get into with you here tonight, uh, Peter Davenport will talk. I mean, he won't go on site and he's not gonna investigate uh, you know, but he will get on the phone. He'll talk to these people on, for cases that seem particularly interesting to him. And, you know, I mean, I, I personally respect Peter's judgment very, very much. He's a very smart guy, very educated, and he's been around. And so when he talks about a witness that he feels is credible, I definitely do take that into account. Anyway, my point is there are a lot of, let us say, very well attested UFO sightings. Very well, and some some do get investigated by like MUFON. I've got one or two that I'll talk about with you as well tonight. So, you know, there's a lot out there. And so my point going back to Ratcliffe's statement, yeah, it's like, of course, man, there's gonna be tremendous numbers of UFO cases out there. If the general public, all right, is reporting, uh, for example, these massive numbers of reports of dark or black triangles around the world, around the world. And there's a lot of these. And, you know, look, we've been seeing these reports for many years now. All right. Somebody is flying those these triangles. And furthermore, these triangles are very typically being seen in the dead of night. So it's not, I mean, some, some are daylight sightings, but I, I am struck, I haven't done a statistical analysis of this, but my own observation, and you know, the fact is I've been diving into UFO reports of the last 20, uh, 30 years actually uh, for research for my next book. So I'm really into the weeds here with this stuff, okay? So I'm, I'm looking at these UFO reports now a lot. And my observation is that there are, pardon me, large numbers of these UFO reports and particularly these triangles where they're seen at two in the morning, three in the morning. Like what's going on? Low, silent, lights at each of the points. Some, sometimes a search light will come down. People will see these, a downward pointing light that will happen once in a while, like it's searching for something. But what is this? And you think aerodynamically, uh, you know, basically triangles aren't really supposed to fly. I mean, you can get them to fly, but you need uh, high, lots of computerized equipment. You need fly-by-wire, which basically allows a thing to make it, you know, like a hundred adjustments per second or whatever. So it stays stable in the air. And since the 1970s, we've had that capability. That's how you get stealth uh, because you needed an unusual design to achieve radar and visibility. Uh, the problem with the unusual design is that it's not really aerodynamic. Like a stealth fighter is not gonna outperform uh, more conventionally designed fighter planes because of its shape. It's just not designed. It's designed to avoid radar. So, um, so to get that unusual shape, you you have to have high level computing capabilities on your plane. Okay, so we've had that for about fifty years now. So, okay, fine. But still, a stealth fighter even that's not a true triangle. And even stealth fighters have stall speeds. These things, however, are seen hovering, and then they stop, they start, they can change direction like right angle turns. They're not always being seen move, moving rapidly. In fact, they're often just 
hovering slowly and they're, they're silent and they're low. What are they doing in your neighborhood at two in the morning when you're outside because you can't sleep or you want to get a cigarette or whatever? Because that's how people see these things. Like what, what is it doing? I don't hear anyone really asking this question, but it's been seen. These, this phenomenon has been noted so frequently around the world. It's not just in North America. It's everywhere. It's every continent. Now, other parts of the world do not generally have the uh, UFO reporting infrastructure all right, that you get with the, with the U.S. and with Canada. Like, we've got a good system here. And so it's, it's much easier uh, to report a UFO. But the fact is, uh, people around the world are now reporting their sightings to uh, these American databases. M more and more, anyway, you're, you're seeing that happen. And so we, are, we see that this phenomenon is absolutely happening worldwide, which, again, Radcliffe confirmed in his statement. So... It's like all the stuff that we've known already, but it's it's it is important. It remains important that you have a, a member of a true member of the establishment, the power establishment. I mean, this is head of the national, you know, the intelligence community chief for a while, uh, making that statement. So yeah, that's very interesting. It's very important. But I don't hear anyone asking, or I don't hear too many people asking, what the hell are these objects doing at two in the morning? covertly, quietly, scanning, going through a neighborhood. Well, there's theories. If they're alien craft, maybe they're doing an abduction. It's not an outrageous theory. I mean, I just have to say that is not an outrageous theory. That could be true. Now, it could also be that it is some other kind of covert op, but then you have to ask yourself, if this is a, a, a let's just say like a U.S. black budget-based covert op, what the hell are they doing? What is this op? It's an operation that I cannot, for myself, really grasp what it is if you're talking uh, standard, if we can use that word, standard black budget type of operation, a standard special access program. What is that mission? And I just think, you know, other people need to be asking this. I don't want to be the only one asking this question. Anyway, so I'm going to show you a couple of slides here. Um, so, in fact, I'm going to start off uh, with a video. So this is this is a slide from the video, and I'm going to show you a clip of the video in a moment. Uh, this is off of YouTube. This is an interesting video. It's not the greatest UFO video that you've ever seen or I've ever seen, but this is from Gosport, United Kingdom from just a couple of years ago, January 9th, 2017. Guy was uh, shooting video. I took the audio out, so you're not going to hear him do video. Um, and this is MUFON's disclaimer, by the way. This is a MUFON um, statement here. Please be cautious. Uh, and you can read here that MUFON has closed the case as an unknown. So that is interesting. And I do not know the specifics of how they did their investigation, but I will conclude, I provisionally will conclude that MUFON, um, you know, uh, oh, let me stop sharing my screen here. Okay, good. And I'm going to show that video, but I'm, I'm going to have to conclude that MUFON at least, uh, you know, check to see, is this some kind of aircraft? Do they check with local military? Uh, I don't know what they actually did here, rule it out, but they did conclude that this is an unknown. So, okay, so I'm gonna show you this video and uh, you could go to the website that I just indicated there. The, the actual video is longer than um, what I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you about 60 seconds worth and I splice it in the middle of that as well, but that's okay. So here you go. Check it out. And in fact, I'm going to give you the full screen. So the guy's commentary is out, and but you can see that there's three lights there. One's moved away from the others, and now it's coming back. Moved away, and now it's coming back. It's going to come back and form uh, like a triangle, you'll see. And then they're going to move back and forth again. And it's just quite unusual. 
Uh, the other thing is that the person recording this was actually zooming in quite substantially. At one point he zoomed out, you don't get to see that here. And you can see he's, he's quite some distance away. So this is at a rail zooming in. He's doing a very good job uh, with avoiding camera shake, I must say, at this level of zoom. So now it's at a perfect triangle, as you can see. Uh, we just spliced here, and now they're separating. And, you know, what is that? And I'm not saying this is an alien craft. I don't know what this is. Is it some kind of interesting drone manipulation, uh, private or military? Again, I don't know. MUFON investigated this, and that's the end of it, I believe. Okay, good. So let's uh, remove that from, there we go. So, yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know what that is, but it's just like one interesting little video. It's like I, if I were the witness at that time, I don't know that I would know how to explain that. There might be a very reasonable conventional explanation for that. So I'm not here to say that it's aliens. Uh, but what I am saying is that there are these unusual things that go on all the time and no one gets an explanation for them. Like we don't get an exp so if it's if the UK military is doing something, all right, fine, great. Uh, what are they going to be that secretive and they can do this over a populated area all the time? Really? Well, yes. I mean, it is that kind of a world now. We don't have we're totally opaque governments, and citizens have like zero ability to get any information out of our governments anymore. But even so, like that's a significant thing for people to inquire about. Right, it's a significant thing to ask about. Uh, so, let me just uh, get my other next slide ready here, and um, sorry, I mean, let me just let me just take this off, and I'll get that ready for the next one. Uh, you know, I just it's a it's a valid question to ask. Like, where are these guys? Why are they not answering anything? Something's happening with someone's technology. We're not being given any explanation. Now, here's one I want to show you that's, uh, I don't have a, a video or a photograph, but it's a, an amazing uh, <clears throat> statement. And it is one, in fact, where Peter Davenport of National UFO Reporting Center uh, uh, communicated with man, with, with this man, excuse me, and uh, basically endorsed the case. So I'm going to read this too. This is a two-part slide here. Uh, this took place in the Gulf of Mexico, March 21st, 2017. And the <clears throat> witness was an engineer on an offshore rig in the Gulf of Mexico. And he just says, close to 7 p.m. on March 21st, uh, just before dusk, myself and four of the crew members aboard our vessel saw a craft that appeared to be five times our 240-foot vessel in length. Uh, my light of sight was about a quarter of a mile from our vessel. There was a rig behind the craft about half a mile. I used this to help gauge size of craft. Sighting was approximately 80 miles southeast of New Orleans, Louisiana. The scene lasted about 40 seconds. Let's go to the next statement. Then this, this is the amazing thing. The craft rose up out of the water of the Gulf of Mexico about 40 feet. No water was dripping from the craft. Within a split second, the craft disappeared at a 30 degree angle into the sky. Speed appeared to be faster than the speed of a light turning on in a room. Within seconds, it had disappeared completely. I can say for sure that the craft was dark colored, oval in shape, so not a triangle, and made no sound whatsoever. With as many rigs too, there had to has to be more witnesses than just the four on our vessel. And oh, let me give you the uh, statement by Davenport here. So Peter just writes, we suspect that he is a very capable and very reliable witness. He estimates that upwards of perhaps 50 people who were aboard nearby vessels may have witnessed the event as well. We would urge those other witnesses to submit reports of what they had witnessed. And that's that's Peter Davenport of the National UFO Reporting Center. So uh, amazing Gulf of Mexico case. And again, you got an object coming out of the water. Now, 
I'm going to assume, I think you are going to assume that the United States military has every capability of detecting these types of occurrences. Every capability. In fact, vastly better capabilities than what we have. They've got underwater sensors. They've got satellites. In fact, the satellites are designed to detect all kinds of anomalous activity in the atmosphere and what's going on even on the ground. In fact, look, they've got HARP, the what is it, High Altitude Auroral Research Project, which, uh, what does that do? One of the things it does, besides frying our brains probably, who the hell knows, but one thing HARP is designed to do is it uses uh, something known as earth penetrating tomography, which allows them to go below the surface of the earth. That's HARP. And to look for things like, you know, cool geologic deposits of, of petroleum and, and precious minerals and things like that. But also, uh, and this was a statement by one of the officials, underground bases. Now, presumably they're talking about underground military bases of adversaries. I'm guessing they weren't talking about underground alien bases if they were looking for them. But I mean, if you were to look for underground alien bases, you'd want to use something like HARP. <clears throat> My point is that our military establishment has got capabilities just up the wazoo. They've got the, all these geosynchronous satellites that are designed to completely envelop and monitor uh, aerial activity on this planet. That is what they do. That's what NORAD is all about to say nothing of activity in Earth orbit and beyond Earth orbit. They monitor all of those things. They have an unbelievable array of technology, which Radcliffe was kind of hinting at in his statement. You know, the fact is the technology they've got is off the chart. And we don't, e we don't even know how advanced their tech is, right? We have to assume it's very good, we have to assume it's better than what we probably know about. And so, again, I just want to come back to the statement by him. Yes, of course, they're going to have an overwhelming superabundance of really good UFO statements. Uh, excuse me, UFO sightings. I'm thinking of his UFO statement. I misspoke. So, okay, so that's a really cool sighting off the Gulf of Mexico. I'm going to just show you a couple of triangle sightings, and I'm going to be out of these slides. I'm going to wrap it up because i got other things I want to talk about here with you. So there's a couple of triangle. So I went into 2014 um, this time, and you know how I came across these? I went into my database, which is uh, – hey, let me just unshare this for a second. I went into my database, which is now massive. It's an absolutely massive UFO chronological database that I have created. It's, um, if it were a book, it would be – literally be probably like a 10 volume massive uh collection like 10 fat volumes of ufo information i just have amassed this over the years a lot of it is ufo sightings a lot of it is ufo news um and like everything related to ufos that i personally consider important so i've got this huge amount but there's a lot of sightings in there and so in preparation for this i thought well, let me just find a couple of decent a couple of good triangle reports because there's so many that I, I can't keep up with all of them. There's just too many. So I, I went into 2014 almost at random and started in January, and I just typed in triangle, and I came up with these three, one on January 17th and two on January 20th of 2014. I'm going to just show you those three, um, and they're all of triangle UFO. So let me uh, – I'm going to go over the first one. This is in uh, New York State in the town of Newburgh. That's um, – a little bit outside of New York City. And this channel, this uh, witness uh, states, I was driving on a very busy road and I and I don't know what time this happened. I, I think it was at, at night, but they don't give the exact time. I was driving on a very busy road and I saw in the trees a row of lights on January 17th. When we came to a clearing in the trees, there was a huge black hovering triangle with bright white lights at each point of the triangle with a blinking red light in the middle. It's like classic. We stopped the car and opened the windows, but heard no noise. How often have you heard this type of a thing, right? It was weird because the huge size of this craft 
should have been making some type of noise. It didn't move, but we took off out of fear as it was one of the scariest moments of my life because I felt, I felt it was watching us just like we were watching them. How many times, if you've gone through UFO reports, have you read something like that? I can tell you for myself many times, many times. These, these witnesses of these sightings see this every day. Like I was saying, with New Fork, it's 20 sightings a day that he gets. And granted, they're not all legit, but then you add to the MUFON database, and then you have to uh, assume that there are lots of sightings that people don't report. Even now, even with the age of the web, like a lot of people don't think to report their unusual sighting. I I'm going to guess more often than not, they don't get reported. So there's a lot of activity that people are noticing. All right, now let me share. This is um, a triangle that was seen in Alabama in the town of Ranburn. Uh, I looked that up. That's um, near the... Uh, kind of central near the border with Georgia. So this person, this, this has a little bit of commentary uh, as well. I think I got this also from Filers Files, which is a still remains a very, very excellent uh, source of UFO news. I strongly recommend. George Filer has been at it for the longest time and um, we're lucky to have him. So anyway, this is from January 20th, 2014, the triangle. And, uh, either filer or someone reporting this to a witness driving east on I-20 nearing exit 205 reported stopping her vehicle at 2 a.m., 2 a.m., to watch a silent triangle-shaped UFO, quote, as large as a football field, moving slowly, treetop, terrified her, and she apparently had missing time. So this is what she writes. I topped the hill, and far in the distance on my right side, I saw the most extreme bright white lights lighting up the entire side of the road and pasture. I was very confused as to what I was looking at. I began to slow my speed as I approached closer, and then I noticed the lights that were shining straight through the tree line onto the interstate had not only risen to above the tree line, but had also turned from pointing toward the road to pointing toward the ground. Not sure what she means by that, but they were pointing toward the ground. She goes on. Uh, then uh, the commentaries of the witness, she then stopped her car. The lights were at treetop level pointing toward the ground. And she says, the lights were attached to a very large triangle shaped object that had rounded edges. Again, something we hear about quite a lot. Rounded edges where the point of the triangle would be. There was no sound and its lights suddenly shut off. The triangle flew over me at treetop level heading northwest. It was a hundred yards long, bigger than a football field, and 50 to 60 feet thick. And that's pretty thick too. I could clearly see a pattern on the bottom and the sides of the object. And that's what we've got from, um, from that. Again, that's Okay, so I don't know who investigated that. But that's a very detailed statement. And, and the problem with dismissing all these statements is that there's so many of them of that level of specificity. Are, are, you really, are we really just going to like dismiss all of that because they didn't get a proper report because not good enough for science? Well, I'm sorry. This is coming in. And they are consistent. And there's a pattern here. And so for my part, yes, I like to look at that pattern. Uh, on the very same day, so this was 2 a.m. Uh, her sighting was 2 a.m. on uh, January 20th. This is uh, a triangle sighting in New Jersey, same day, but that evening. So it's kind of like the next day, because this is like just before midnight. So it's January 20th at 1125 p.m., 35 minutes before midnight in a town called Salem, New Jersey. I'm just going to read this guy's statement. I was at work and went outside uh, and noticed the moon was low with another bright white light crossing below the moon. I grabbed my binoculars. All right, he's got binoculars. To see a triangle shaped craft with lights on each corner. Here we go again. This is the same day as the earlier sighting by the woman on the road. He says the front light was a solid white light while the back two lights were randomly changing from white 
to red and blue. I followed the silent triangle for 40 seconds until it disappeared behind the trees. The object was big and not an airplane. And I've just got this statement. This is from New Jersey MUFON, which uh, apparently did investigate this case. Uh, at the time of deciding, I don't think they'd made a determination. Uh, it would be interesting to see what they determined. But a representative of Moot, uh, New Jersey MUFON, Ken Pfeiffer, stated this. I think he gave this for George Filer, for Filer's Files. He said, we have investigated numerous triangle sightings over southern New Jersey and the Salem nuclear plant on the Delaware River that attracts these sightings. And uh, that's all the slides I have for you. So now you just have you got me to look at for the rest of this program. Uh, amazing statement. And I, I can tell you that I came to those triangle sightings for you tonight almost at random. Almost at random. Like I just said, all right, go to 2014 and let's see what we got. And the first month of that year, I, I got those three and I just stopped. I'm like, okay, we have enough. So my point is that there is a lot of these. Um, and so it, this is a widespread phenomenon, okay? And again, I want to get back. I want to let's circle back, as people like to say these days. Let's circle back to the UAP task force that is in the works. Uh, I have to assume, like, if they're actually going to get this thing done by June, that there's someone right now, or at least today, or maybe this week. It's COVID, so no one works, no one goes to their office. But someone <laughs> is responsible for putting these reports together. And, like, you know, I asked myself. Um, so where are they getting their reports from within the military? Like say Navy and Air Force. Okay. We can assume that. Uh, although, and then there's the army, the army gets these two, these reports as well. Um, and there's other military services. Uh, are they getting them from all military services? I don't know. I would like to know that answer. Are they, also, and I'm sure the answer to this is no, are they going to any private contractors that deal with this phenomenon? Uh, for example, are they going to get into phenomenon that we lovingly refer to as UFO crash retrievals? I'm sure the answer to that is absolutely no. That's the red line that they must not go over. You know, they can't go into crash retrievals because if you start really getting into that, and, you know, last summer, the New York Times article on this hinted pretty suggestively that there were UFO crash retrievals. And then in a follow-up interview over at Project Unity, excellent interview by that, Jay, uh, he, he was interviewing Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal, and Jay really almost got them to say that this was the case, that they knew that there were crash retrievals, but they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. Okay, fair enough. Anyway, uh, that's the red line. I've talked about this in previous episodes here on YouTube. That is the you, they're not going to go over that. They're not going to get into the whole concept of crash retrievals because then the game is up. You can't just say, well, there's something out there. We don't know what they are. Can't do that. When If you acknowledge that you've acquired artifacts and you are studying those artifacts, we, we've got to an unofficial acknowledgement of it, but there's not an official acknowledgement of it. And that, I think, is not going to happen for a very long time. So whatever this task force is going to recover, uh, cover, excuse me, um, you know, they presumably they've got a large database that they can work from. But the question is, how much of that are they actually going to be able to put into this report? I guess that's the question I ask. How much of this massive treasure trove of awe-inspiring UFO sightings that I just gave you the tiniest, most random sliver of just now? All right. I mean, I told you I've got about 10, probably about 10 volumes worth of a UFO database. Not all of those are sightings, but a lot of that are sightings. And if I can provide such a massive amount of UFO sightings by just witnesses from around the world, I've got to assume the United States military complex has got a much better capability of getting some very good reports and sightings and data. And how much of that are they going to share? So video, yeah, that'd be interesting. Good photograph, 
That would be cool. Um, reports would be really good. But the question is, well, I'm, I'm not going to go into all the implications. I've talked about this part before. Like, basically, what I think will happen for that is um, there'll be a report. They'll put some information out there. People will be like, wow, this is some interesting UFO reports. But it won't move us any further down the field. We'll be exactly where we are right now, which is, yeah, there's some interesting sightings. Are We don't know what they are, to which I just – I'm going to call BS. Because here's the thing. If you're in the military and if you are – investigating this right now, it is somebody's obligation to ask some very fundamental questions about these objects, because that is the job of the military. The military's job is to protect the nation. And when unknown craft are hanging out by your nuclear installations and just skulking about at 2 a.m., in a covert manner, seemingly night after night, then yeah, you're going to want to look into that. You're going to want to know what are these things. You're going to know who's flying these things. Who is flying these things? Is it the Russians? Cue to roll your eyes. Is it the Chinese? Like, no, it's, it's not the Russians. It's not the Chinese. It's ridiculous to think that. Think about how provocative how, how astonishing it would be like, like, holy, Matt, wow, Russia, you've got, you've got silent flying triangles that can just penetrate U.S. airspace. That's pretty nifty. No, it's not the Russians. It's not the Chinese. Everyone knows this. Okay. So military people got to be asking this. And they're going to say, well, is it ours? Is it ours? Is it ours? And they ask us all the time, I'm sure. And it's a fair question to ask. Fair question to ask. But there are implications from that question. And it makes me like crazy when I hear people just shrug these things off as well, it's probably black budget secret government project. I'm like, really? You have no more curiosity to ask than just that. Like you're oh yeah, just secret government. Like, do you not care? What is the science? The science, one thing, that makes these things do what they do. Like, that's pretty damned interesting. Do you not care what they are doing? why they are doing what they're doing. Like, if this is a black budget operation, don't just say that and walk away from it like, okay, that answers it, because it doesn't really answer it, like at all, all right? That's a that's a cop-out of an answer, and, and, you know, we hear this all too often. So if it's black budget, fine, but at least, like, come on, obligate yourself to doing a little bit better than that than taking the ultra lazy way out and say, oh, it's a black budget program. Like, and oh yeah, the science is just magic. It's like I can't figure it out. It's just magical science. Like the Tic Tac UFO of 2004, instantly accelerating to uh, probably more than 10,000 miles per hour instantly. Uh, oh yeah, just magical technology, black budget. Sure, okay, great. So go, go in the corner there now and don't talk to anyone. Like, that's what you should say to those people. So military has got to be asking who's flying these things. And look, how hard is it to come to some extreme conclusions about this? You start looking at these reports as people were doing 70 plus years ago. By the way, they were looking at these UFO reports and concluding then seeing the same performances, by the way, as well. Like, Instant acceleration, altitudes that we don't know how to reach those altitudes, hovering, stopping, taking off, it, it, you know, all of that. They've been noticing this since before World War II. We've had these reports. Okay. So it ain't black budget. And you've got to assume there are some very smart and sophisticated people in the United States military establishment who are looking at these reports and they know. What we know, that there's not a valid conventional explanation for these things. And then on top of that, if you're, if you're studying this from a military, basically counterintelligence perspective, you have to ask other questions as well. You got to ask, what are these things up to? You know, why are they doing this type of activity? What does it represent? It's very, 
sneaky. It's very sneaky. And it has been like this for years and years and years and years. And so then we ask some other questions. And this is why this, this is why I said the UFO problem is intractable. Because now when you're starting to deal with this as a public phenomenon, which is starting to happen, this is this is causing this is going to going to continue to cause real problems. Because this is a problem that doesn't have a solution. And that's the reality of the UFO phenomenon. It doesn't really have a solution here. So let's ask ourselves, is it human or not? We like to do this either or. Is it human or not? And, you know, I ask myself this question quite a lot. I'm sure you've asked it quite a lot. So there's a couple of permutations here that, in, that are even more than either or. But let's just say either or for the moment. Uh, so if it's a human infrastructure that's behind all of this, like that's actually almost more difficult to accept than an alien infrastructure. And it, and it might even be scarier. I mean, I don't know, but, you know, for example, there was that uh, encounter. I was talking, um, I was on Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, I don't know, a few weeks ago. We talked about, it was in, Jan, I think, January 20-something or other of this last year, uh, or is it of 2020? Yeah, of an uh, aviation encounter, one of, one of many, where they're in uh, north, uh, was it northeastern New Mexico, I think, and outside of the missile range, uh, you know, where missiles are tested and a missile like object was zooming by, I think it was an American airlines flight and it made the news and there was a recording of it and all of that. So, you know, when you think about that, okay, missile off track, like that's actually, I don't think so. That would, that's almost scarier than aliens. Like we can't control our missiles. I don't. I don't no one has concluded that it was an, a missile of any sort. No, the, the fact is, no one knows what that thing was. Nobody knows what that thing was. And these things are happening all the time. So, but if it's a human-made infrastructure, then we're talking an absolutely massive infrastructure from our civilization that is responsible for all of this. Why does no analyst in the corporate controlled media establishment even bother to ask that question? Like that's a really logical thing to go to. Like human or not human, if human, then that's kind of an awesome thing to consider here and kind of a scary thing to consider. And I don't hear anyone discussing that. But the fact is, it seems to me highly improbable that this is a strictly speaking, solely human infrastructure. Now, um, it could still be a somewhat human infrastructure. I say somewhat, I'm hedging my bets here. Uh, so if it's an alien infrastructure, first of all, let's just do that. So if it's alien, then you could say, well, do they have a base off world? Do they have a base in space? Or do they have a base on the far side of the moon or on Mars even, or who knows where? Do they have a base somewhere and then they just come here? Or maybe are they just folding space time from their star system and they can come here and you know leave just as easily as walking down the street? I don't know. Maybe they can do that. So maybe they don't need to be based here. They just come back and forth. Or, or maybe they're not extraterrestrial. Maybe they there is a dimension of reality that is just beyond us. We can't perceive it, but they can penetrate that. And that's possible. What do I know? I'm not a physicist. I mean, you know, all I do is I hear what these physicists talk about in multiple dimensions and potentially different universes that may just be right here. No one really knows. Even they don't know, and they're very smart, and they study this. But is it possible? Well, I would say just based on observational data that we have with UFOs that, yes, it's possible, it's totally possible, that we're dealing with a dimensional phenomenon to some degree. It doesn't really matter to me personally, whether they're from another planet or another dimension. I mean, it's an interesting scientific uh, thing to ponder. Well, look at this. I'm almost going into an hour. I was going to do this for a half hour. What is my deal here? I'm trying to get this thing done efficiently, and I just can't stop. All right, anyway. The fact is, interdimensional, extraterrestrial, I'm almost like, who gives a... Can I swear on this thing? I'm not going to swear. Anyway, who cares? 
it almost doesn't matter. It's interesting scientifically, but in terms of how it affects our society, I don't really think it's a huge uh, bone of contention here, frankly. All right, so now are they alien and they've got a base here? They got a base under the ocean. Something came out of the Gulf of Mexico that that man observed in, uh, what was it, 2017. And he's not the only one. People see these things come out of the water all the time. So my assumption is, yes, there's probably an establishment probably under the water. Probably. If they're coming out of the water, they've, they're down there for some reason. There's got to be a place for them. Maybe many places for them. Totally possible. After all, objects are seen going into and out of the water pretty much all over the globe. Gulf of Mexico is a big area where this has been noticed, however. Seems to me. So they may they may be fully alien and they got a base here. Or it gets even better. Are they among us? Question I've been asking quite a lot lately. Many of you are familiar with David Jacobs' work, Walking Among Us. David wrote other books as well, of course. But I guess we it's fair to say Walking Among Us, his last book is probably his most um, widely discussed book, and for obvious reasons. So he's, his theory is that they have infiltrated human society, they being the aliens, and they've got what he calls hubrids, that is human-looking hybrids, and they are in our society. So that's David's argument. Now, not everyone agrees with it. Not everyone agrees with it. There are experienced UFO researchers who are like, no, sorry, no sale. Uh, however, my own opinion is I do, I <laughs> gotta always be, you always have to be careful with how I say things here because this is such a crazy contentious topic. But I guess I would just say, uh, I think it would be foolish to rule that out. And that's putting it mildly. I think some of his, I think David's research and that I'm going along with Bud Hopkins and John Mack and current abduction researchers as well. All of them talk about hybrids. I do not personally believe that all of these people are leading these witnesses in exactly the same way. I just don't believe it. Something is going on here and this information is coming to them. So that's one possible scenario. Another possible scenario is something I wrote about in my last book, which just a few months ago, which I call The Alien Agendas, um, where one thing I've speculated on is that there have been human looking beings that don't seem quite like us, they seem like they're operating on another level that we have been interacting with for apparently a very long time. Now, look, admittedly, right? We don't know. You're going into folklore. You're going into old stories. It's true. There's all kinds of possibilities. But for my part, when I read enough of these, yes, this is what I think. It's entirely possible. And plus, on top of that, there are uh, quite a large number of recent and contemporary claims of similar types of encounters, of that is human looking aliens or whatever they are. Maybe they're humans genetically, but they're working for the other side, whatever. Or maybe the aliens aren't the other side. Maybe the aliens aren't our enemies. Maybe they are. But the fact is the question that I'm asking, and if, and if you were a counterintelligence officer or military person charged with national security in the study of these UFO reports, Seems to me that you have to look at all of these possibilities. You have to. Why? You think, oh no, that's outrageous, alien infiltration. No, it isn't. Of course it's not outrageous because someone's got technology that's here that's not supposed to exist. That's starting point. Someone's got it. And if we cannot realistically or credibly state that it's ours, it's the Russians, it's the Chinese, it's the Brits, it's the French, it's whoever. Can't do it. The Indians or the Pakistanis now. Everyone's getting in the game with advanced tech. But we still cannot credibly pass these UFO sightings off to any other nation or group. And if we can't do that, then we, as generations of very smart people before us, have also concluded there are there are others who are here, right? It's not an outrageous conclusion just looking at the UFO evidence. And if you conclude that others are here, then you have to ask, what are they up to? 
And this is again where the themes of my uh, my last book come in. And I'm not going to get into this whole thing about the fourth stage of humanity yet again. I talk about this a lot. I'm a very big believer in this theory that our species is about to enter its fourth fundamental organization from hunting and gathering to sedentary agriculture to science and industry and now to whatever this craziness that we're moving into now at the speed of light, at the speed of COVID lockdowns, basically. We're going into this completely new world that is remaking not just things here and there, little tweaks, it's remaking our entire civilization. It's going to remake human psychology, probably human biology and everything else. Like we're moving into the fourth stage of humanity. Uh, for a while I called it the transhumanist stage. Um, maybe we can call it the digital stage. Maybe we can call it the 24 seven control stage. I don't know. All right. Maybe we can call it the AI stage, but it's, it's all of those things and more. And it's going to completely change us. And, and the reason I'm mentioning it here is because I firmly now believe that this is intimately connected to why we are being visited in such an intense way right now. We've always been an interesting species, but let's face it, like for the most part, human beings are operating at a very low technological level. And you, if you saw an unusual thing like in the sky, like what could you really do about it? Nothing, essentially. And what would they want to do with us? Take over human society and like live in, live in the castles, the unheated castles that we built? Like seriously, they're not gonna be interested in that. But with our capabilities of the last 100 years, especially where we have just gone straight up, <laughs> literally and figuratively, uh, we now actually have monumentally greater capabilities as a society than we've ever had by far, right? We all know this. We forget it. We forget this all the time, but we have it. It's an awesome capability with weapons and means of communication, means of travel, means of uh, gathering information, all of this has gone exponential, parabolic. And so if you're an observing intelligence, if you have the ability to observe, you're going to be interested in us right now, right now. This is the time. And if that is the time, then you got to be looking at humanity with a critical eye. And you're going to ask yourself a couple of things. If you're an alien, you're going to be like, are they going to be a problem? And you might think, problem. We're like insects compared to them. And I'm like, no, we're not like insects compared to aliens any longer. We have, we're about to develop, we've already got quantum computing, for God's sake. We've got AI algorithms now that can learn Go and chess like that and easily defeat our greatest grandmasters. Like within a a day or less of studying the game from ground zero. All right. We have, uh, you know, the list is endless now and it's only growing. It's only, only going to become more astonishing in the coming years. So of course they're going to be interested in us. We're not going along at this little level like we were for years and years and years and years and thousands of years beyond that. No, no. We are, we're recreating our species fundamentally. So with that knowledge, they got to know this. Will they want to, how do we put this? Will they want to manage that process for their own protection? Hmm, that's an interesting thought. Sure as hell they might. If 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 we were super intelligent aliens looking at this species that's pretty curious, pretty aggressive, pretty headstrong, pretty emotional, and suddenly they've got the keys to the kingdom, you know, and they're going to be in your neighborhood like any moment now. And no, maybe they can't take you in a street fight just yet, but they might be a real nuisance. Then, yes, you might very well want to manage that problem. And how do you manage that problem? Well, you put your people in there. Of course you would. Of course you would. How would that process work? I don't know. Lots of different ways it might work. And I'm not saying it, that's the case, by the way. I'm not saying definitively that that is the case. But what I am saying is that if you're game planning this scenario 
And if you are a responsible military analyst, you have to consider that as a possibility because it's actually, when you really get into the, it seems crazy at first, but it is not illogical. It's not illogical. And so this is why we're dealing with an intractable problem. Any way you look at this from a public point of view, significant admissions about this phenomenon are a serious problem. All right, not if you even forget the whole possibility of infiltration. Put that aside if you don't like that. We don't have to. The fact is that there is an awe-inspiring number of sightings that are taking place every week, every month, every year. Who are these people? What do they want? That is a problem that if too much information, too much data were to be released by the military, like if they were to, what if, what if the military were to um, talk about the sightings of the USS Roosevelt in 2014, 2015? All right, so if you remember your recent history, the New York Times wrote about this uh, in 2019, I believe. Yes, spring of 2019. And that's when Leslie and Ralph, very good article. This is on the nine month period and from summer of 2014 to the spring of 2015, in which the USS Roosevelt off the Eastern US coast had, according to them, nearly daily encounters with UAP. Now, for nine months, that's more than 200 days. That's uh, whatever, 220, to whatever it is. It's a lot of days. So are you going to tell me that you had over 200 <laughs> UFO sightings in that region by that craft alone? Is that what you're telling us? Because that's what it sounds like. And that's just one ship. So are we going to get all of the Roosevelt encounters? Like, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Like, we know this is something you might argue where they should do that because, A, we know about, about it now. We know it happened. It's been reported on by the New York Times. It's public knowledge uh, that this happened. We've had witnesses. They've talked about it. So if, if the, the task force report were even to cover all of those sightings, all 200 plus of them, let's say, like that would be pretty interesting, would it not? And it might be more than interesting. It might be explosive. It might be frightening. It might be, uh, this might be, you know, like when you get into the large quantity of these reports and if you get into enough detail, well then, then you got a real problem on your hands because then like, you're in danger of giving so much information that you now you can't take it back and you're giving too much ammunition to people to ask even more probing questions. And um, I, I just, I cannot see a scenario in which that is an attractive option for our, for the United States government, which in our lifetimes has gone through a transformation. I mean, it was bad when I was born back in 1962. <laughs> but at least we had Kennedy back then, right? Now we're at a point where we have gone through really a series of political revolutions since then to create a system of government. I mean, I don't even think authoritarian covers it. I, I use the word totalitarian because I think it's actually an accurate indicator of the desire and implementation of total control, total knowledge over a population that is totalitarian. And so that is the world we're moving into at the speed of COVID. We're moving there. So to expect honest answers out of a transformed state that we are all seeing happen before our eyes, I just think is not a realistic thing to to do. I don't think it's realistic to expect any kind of um, genuinely useful, publicly uh, like motivated information to come out. But I do think that there is enough pressure, like they're going to have to give something. So I think if, you know, 
if I'm going to make a prediction, and I guess I sh I have been making this all along, I think we're going to see a sliver, a sliver of what exists. Because the reality of the massive UFO sightings is there is just too much. There, there has to be too much for them to process. And if they were truthfully to announce that fact, well, you tell me what that would result in. You know, you can imagine the United States government and a, and a, a report to Congress, like you just know, like they're not going to get what they want. But if they were to say, you know, let's let's play this out. Yes, we've had uh, in the last five years a total of uh, 15,000. <laughs> That's low, really. Uh, well, let's just say 10,000 good quality UFO engagements that we have tracked with our satellites, with our sensors, and yada, yada, yada. Did he just say yada, yada, yada? I just did. Okay. Remember that from Seinfeld? Yeah. Okay. Of course you do. Anyway, you can imagine what the response would be if they said that. Yeah, there's been X number of thousand of encounters that we've had. And I'll guarantee you, they've, or if not a, an official encounter, then a tracking. They've had it. It's happened. Because there's just too much activity that we're seeing without them. And they have better capabilities than we have. They don't have more sets of eyeballs. I mean, it's true. You know, there's lots of people around, around the world, but they've got incredible technological capabilities that we can only dream about. So yeah, they've got to be collecting a massive amount. And they can't, they can't give it all up. It's too much. It's too, you know, our world is already just ripping apart at the seams, which is what I talked about last week. It's just like going, <laughs> we're, we're, we're destroying the basis and foundation of a, of what, once was a civilization. Um, so that's all going away and we've got economic crises staring us in the face. We've got um, all kinds of problems here. And, you know, I, I did they want to just throw this one also into the pile? I don't think so. So anyway, that's my, that's my take on this for tonight. That's all I've got for you. I went way longer than I expected. So anyway, let me just say, before I wrap it up fully, if you like this content, if you like what I do here, think about subscribing to this channel. It doesn't cost a dime. Subscribe to the channel. People ask me all the time, does that cost me anything? I'm like, no, it doesn't cost you anything. Hit the subscribe button. There you go, boom. And it helps your YouTube feed. Like if you like this type of content, you'll get other content like, like what I give you, what I give. Um, so subscribe. Crush the like button, smash it. Let YouTube know you support what happens here. And don't forget to turn on notifications for this channel so you don't miss any new programs. I want to thank all of I'm seeing you all in the chat room. And you have to understand, I'm sorry that I can't. It's, I, it is impossible for me to comment on what you're, whatever you're saying while I'm, I'm, you know, dishing it out here. I just can't do it. It's not possible. So I, I think you all understand, but I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, I love seeing, I see some familiar names there and thank you all for being here. I want to thank, uh, you know, Pursuing X for doing all the things that they do. Tracy, I think she may have popped in here. Uh, can't really see. She said she would uh, for computers working and everything. So I want to thank everyone for being here. And I wish all of you a great day, great evening, wherever you are. Thank you for being here with me. Catch you next time. Let us keep fighting the good fight. Till next time. Bye.